My name is Juanita Steven, J-U-A-N-I-T-A, -A, last name S-T-E-P-H-E-N. Right now I'm working as a substance abuse counselor with a national charity. Uh, well, each day is really different, um, but I'm working with youth um, between the ages of 14 and 24 who are engaged at substance use at all levels, um, from mild to chronic, um, and helping them with their goals. So we work from a harm reduction perspective, so it's just helping them, meeting them wherever they're at. It's a voluntary program, so sometimes I'm working with people for three days, sometimes I'm working with them for three months or longer. So sometimes it's a really clinical kind of setting so I have an office space where sometimes youth will come in and meet me in my office for um, counseling one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions um, and sometimes I'm going into the community to meet with them in coffee shops or at their schools or uh, at a bus stop or wherever they can get to to work on um, short mid and long-term goals uh, in a one-on-one -on -one counseling atmosphere. I'm in ongoing training all the time so um, the the CYW program obviously was the, um, the starting point for me um, where there was lots of academic and in-class learning um, and since then in my other positions where I've worked, I've worked in some residential, um, some residential spaces as well and I've just been doing trainings in the community so um, ongoing trainings in terms of um, counseling approaches, um, clinical pharmacology and um, just youth engagement strategies. Just all the time, so I'm probably at 10 to 12 trainings per year to just keep getting more skills. I think the biggest challenge so far has been um, when I'm working with a youth who really has expressed a desire to make some significant changes in their life, um, has the motivation, but struggles to actually follow through with those changes. And when I watch some of the health implications and some of the harm that's um, being some of the harm that's happening in their life, um, to watch some of that happening, but also know that it's a process that things, that change only happens um, at the rate of the individual. So some individuals come in really motivated and really ready to change and are able to make some significant changes really quickly. And for others, because of the length and involvement in their substance use and the different levels that it's affected, um, different parts of their life, that change can happen slower. And to see some of the, the negative implications is sometimes really challenging to watch. And um, I mean, staying with it and, and not taking it home and, and not internalizing it can be really challenging. The best part is when I'm no longer needed. The best part is when um, I've worked with a young person um, to the point where they've got the skills that they once um, looked to me for support around um, and they're able to just say, Juanita, I don't, I don't need to meet with you anymore because I'm, I'm good. I feel confident in my ability to do this on my own. So I think that's the best part. I think that what I would have wanted to know is that there are so many more um, capacities in which a child and youth worker can do really meaningful, fulfilling work um, than, than you really know about. Um, so coming into the program, I had heard about like school settings and residential settings and that was kind of it. There's a, there was a few more kind of areas, but I, I didn't know the capacity to which I could work independently and still a part of a team in really clinical settings to do really meaningful work that, um, that I have the skills, that I've learned the skills to be able to do a really good job in. So there's a whole world, a, like a variety of, of spaces and places to do child and youth work. And um, I think that would have been helpful for me to know because I would have gone straight there from high school as opposed to going to university and doing all these other things first. It's really, it's really powerful. Yes, um, so in August of last year, I founded um, a nonprofit organization called One Heart Canada Youth Arts Initiatives. So we do social programming um, for youth, children and youth um, through artistic mediums. So just it's creative self-expression and social awareness and education and empowerment. Um, I wanted to merge my two loves, my love of art and self-expression, which has helped me through so many hard times in my own life, um, and my love of doing child and youth work and working with youth um, and bring them together in um, a setting that is really natural and appropriate for the young people that I'm working with. So um, in 
in roles that I've been in where it's a very clinical space, um, that doesn't work for all of the youth that I've, I've come in contact with. And sometimes that space just feels very unnatural and the conversations are very um, forced and, and rigid just because of the space that we're in in the, the medium. So um, this was a way to help youth to express themselves creatively, um, to learn some skills around um, learning about themselves, learning how to express themselves, how to interact with other people, and just all of those basic life skills and communication skills and social skills that, um, that we address in various areas of the field in just um, a really natural kind of way. So one of the groups that we run is a girls group. So um, we go into the high school that the girls um, attend and after school for two hours we do um, arts projects while we we talk while we chat about different things that are relevant to the girls in the program. So it's really specific to the, um, the geographical area that they're in, the needs of the school, what's going on for the girls. They give feedback for us about what sort of things they'd like to touch on, which things are important to them. And while we're chatting, we're making bracelets or we're making t-shirts that have their own positive slogans on them. We have done um, clay work. We've done um, painting to whatever Whatever songs, um, whatever love songs of the day are are relevant to them, and, and talking about what feelings um, come up for them when they're hearing these different songs, or thinking about the different um, images of girls in the media. We have done collages, just all sorts of different mediums we've used to address issues that are relevant to them at that time. Um, they've. They're dealing with uh, self-esteem, with um, self-efficacy, with um, dating violence, with um, gender issues and sexuality, with family relationship issues, with um, academic um, issues, just whether it's being able to actually get to class or being able to manage the workload um, with peers. Bullying, we do a lot of that. Cyberbullying, um, a lot of the girls did not realize that they were engaged in um, various types of bullying so just raising awareness around issues that they may not be able to put a name to and then um, helping them to kind of work through them helping each other they do a lot of the the teaching each other and holding each other accountable and learning from each other in that group and and it's really just having um, a supportive adult there we have two facilitators to support and um, address crises as they come up and we partner with the the school to just make sure that everything is kind of seamless the for younger children right now we have um, a program in the works called we create um, and so it's actually um, a parent and um, taught program. So it addresses um the emotional and developmental needs of the child. It addresses the uh, parenting skill development and also attachment. So it's a drop-in group um, for um, young parents to come in with um, their children and to do um, arts projects together. So whether it's uh, creating a turkey out of a traced hand and, and talking about what their Thanksgiving might look like or um, just creating any projects that the young child can have a hand in and that the parent can and support them in um, and again that has at least two um, facilitators to just work on those uh, those different skill development and addressing the different needs for for both parties involved and you founded this organization so your role is um, I'm the the founder slash executive director slash facilitator slash researcher <laughs> so I wear quite a few hats in it because it's really really brand new and, and so it's it's growing um, and actually the my board of directors and advisory committee um, our majority of them are child and youth workers as well and we've got um, some other um, creative minds who have contributed to the program development for you um, yeah, I've got lots of stories. I think one of the things that's really, um, that's been really good learning for me is when all of the training and all of the, the talking and the learning comes to a head and they have to be put into practice. So um, I was working with a young girl um, who was coming to meet with me for one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions around some substance use issues and um, an issue of potential um, um, risk came up. Um, she was uh, 16 years old and when in our conversation she had disclosed to me um, something that I was unsure if it was something that needed to be reported um, to uh, the Children's Aid Society. So I I spoke to her and let her know that this was something that was concerning to me and that I would like to call the Children's Aid Society for some for some consultation if it was something that was reportable. Um, 
and she was very upset at me. She was, um, she had been involved with Children's Aid before, so, and she hadn't had a really positive experience with it. So the idea of me calling CAS, even just to ask a question about her particular situation anonymously, was very hard for her to deal with. And um, she became verbally um, aggressive, she became physically uh, aggressive, stood up and came towards me. And at that point, I went really quickly through my mind for all of the crisis intervention training, um, all of the de-escalation skills, all of the verbal engagement, all of the pieces that we learn about, we talk about, we write assignments about, and we prepare for. And then in that moment, it's no longer about calling Children's Aid right there. It's about my personal safety. It's about her safety. It's about helping her to feel safe so that she will maintain a safe environment there. Um, and thankfully, I was able to uh, to speak to her and help her to, to understand um, that she wasn't at any immediate risk, that the situation, we were gonna work through it together and that I wasn't trying to tell on her, which is, is kind of where she, she felt I was coming from. Um, and at the end of that, that counseling session, we made the phone call together. I called with her in the room so she could hear on speakerphone, so she could hear the conversation. It was very transparent and, and it ended up being something that um, I didn't need to report. So um, to cover everybody's safety, we made that phone call together and she was um, comfortable. She, at the end of it, she didn't feel comfortable coming back to continue meeting with me. I gave her that option and, and she transferred to go see another counselor. So, you know, um, ideally I would have liked to be able to continue to work with her. That would have felt good for me, but she didn't feel um, like that was the best uh, relationship. So I wish that it had a happy bow on the ending, but it didn't. She's continuing to be supported, just not by me. So um, I think that that story for me was a lot of learning that um, things aren't always going to end the way that I want them to, but if you act in the best interest of yourself and the individual, then ultimately the, the best ending is going to be the one that came out of it. My name is Lisa Malika, M-O-L-L-I-C-A. Um, and, and agency enrolled? I am a family intervention worker with a Child Protection Agency. There are many different typical days. So my role could be working with families whose children are in care. So that means that um, they are in foster homes or group homes, or they could be working with families whose children remain in their custody, um, or with children themselves and um, individual from their family who are in care and need some extra support. So it might start off with working um, in my office at my desk, doing some research, reading some files on families um, whose cases were assigned to me, finding out their backgrounds and creating treatment plans, um, or doing assessment work. So every 60 and then 90 days subsequently, we do reports uh, on the progress of our families and create new goals. Um, and then I would most likely go out into the community and do some home visits with families and um, try and create some progress on their goals, learn a little bit about their own parenting history um, and help them make some shifts in their own parenting and their own families to ensure that their kids can remain in their custody. Um, I might do what we call therapeutic access visits um, with families to try and increase their parenting skills and their level of understanding of their children and their behaviors. And those could be in the community for families that have sort of progressed from having their visits in our office. Um, so it could be at the mall or at the park or at any sort of children's play area. Um, and then it could be a case conference in the afternoon. So with a multidisciplinary team, so with the child's worker, with maybe our lawyers or um, some type of psychologist or, or play therapist that's been doing work with the child and the family to sort of see what their progress is and come up with a treatment plan to move forward. That's a huge job. Yeah. It's, a, it's a long day. <laughs> sure, so generally when people think about child protection and working with families um, with that agency, they think of physical abuse. Um, children that have been physically abused and parents that have been sort of the abuser. 
while definitely those are families that we would service, nine times out of 10, that's not the type of families, or they're in, I think, the, the minority in um, the group of families that we work with. So generally, it's some kind of neglect, and it would be emotional neglect. It would be um, medical neglect. So children have mental health disorders or some type of behavioral disorder um, that the parents aren't sort of paying appropriate attention to. Um, and so when I go into a family a lot of times, especially when a child is in sort of older latency or adolescence, the child is sort of held up by the parents. It's okay, see this is see this behavior, this is why you're here. Please fix this. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Um, and once I start my sort of goal working with the family is to find out what the deeper root of that child's behavioral problem is. So generally it's parents who don't have the parenting capacity to either manage what some of the special needs of their children are, so behavioral needs, or whose parenting capacity has created these behaviors in their children. Um, so my first step working with families is what we call a parenting interview. And so I learn an, an, a ton about this parent's history through that parenting interview, and it leads you to, to, to make more informed conclusions. So I have worked with parents who themselves have had horrific abusive pasts, who might have had completely withdrawn parents, or um, who have their own uh, addiction issues. And that has sort of led to the situation that their own family is in right now, and some of the work that I have to do with them. So one of the families that I've worked with were great people, and they meant so well for their children. And they loved their children and wanted nothing more than to have their children back in their care. Um, and I started working with them <clears throat> when it was sort of looking like the children were gonna be made crown wards and therefore permanently not in their custody. And what we found out through that parenting interview and that work is that they had terrible pasts. They had really abusive parenting. They had a lot of trauma themselves and a lot of damage emotionally. And they promised themselves they would never, ever do that to their children, and they didn't. But in that absence, they hadn't learned any appropriate parenting. They didn't know how to nurture appropriately. They didn't know how to play and sit on the floor. They didn't know how to provide even adequate meals for their children. So <clears throat> they had two young toddlers who were pretty much completely emotionally and physically neglected because these parents were so paralyzed in their own past that they didn't know how to do anything in what you would think of as an appropriate manner. So these children were one and a half and three and had no language. They were completely emotionally dysregulated. So they would be running around the room not knowing what to do. Because these parents didn't create secure attachments, the three-year-old wouldn't let the parents near him at all. He would not seek them out when he was hurt. He would not seek them out when he was happy and didn't even want any physical proximity from them. So working with them to understand and teaching them these parenting skills that they hadn't been taught before allowed them to create this relationship with their kids, create this trust with them, um, and allow them to allow their children to see them as safe people, as parents, as um, people that were worthy of their trust and their security, and also that what was really important was people that could keep them safe. So this one child that was all over the place, the parents had to learn how to be an authority figure in order to keep him safe and to gain that trust. And for the one of the parents in particular, that authority figure role was very difficult because of the trauma in his own past. And so even having a firm voice with that child was something that was completely triggering for him and something that took a lot of work and a lot of practice and a lot of role play with myself sitting in their living room until eight o'clock at night role playing, I'm the child, you know, I've just run out into the street, what voice are you gonna use and how is that gonna be different from 
please come and sit down properly at the table. And so learning that understanding and understanding how it's okay to be firm and to be stern as a parent and, and that's going to allow him to love you and gain that trust was a really big step for them. And ultimately they were very successful and the children remain in their care and their custody now for an extended period of time. So it, it was difficult work, but it was obviously very successful. Yeah, so. so what is the best part? There, whenever I tell people what I do, my first reaction, or the first reaction I get pretty much all the time is, oh, I could never do that. I could, it's so hard. How can you do that? It's so draining. And it is. It's really hard. It's really draining. And the percentage of not so great times definitely outweighs the great times. The difference in this work is that that small percentage of good stuff is so good that it outweighs all of the bad. So I read a lot of bad stuff on a daily basis and I hear a lot of bad things, but I know that there are children who would have grown up in foster care and because of their behaviors, if they weren't fixed, eventually in group care. And it's, that's not an ideal place for a child to live their life. And I know because of the work that I've done that there are numerous children now who are with their parents in a secure home, in a secure family. And knowing that I was a part of that is immeasurable and makes up for all the times that I've been yelled at or threatened or out until 11 o'clock at night writing case notes of an incident. It's, it makes up for all of that. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Well, I lost my ring. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> Um, well, I teach um, some academic courses as well as um, supervise a field work class and it has been one of the biggest surprises, I think. It was something while I was in school that I always thought as sort of a distant thing, oh I would love to do that. Um, and being able to do that has been a huge surprise and a, a really big joy. Um, seeing little sparks happen all over the room and seeing people sort of click and and, and get things and get theories and, and sharing their experiences in, in the field has been hugely rewarding for me in a way that I, I wasn't sure or I didn't expect it to be. Um, it also allows me to, to see sort of how far I've come in what might seem chronologically not such a long time, but in terms of my career and my growth and my learning, it is pretty significant, so to see um, to see little faces in my head, little faces looking back at you, listening to what you're saying, um, and sort of and and getting it and implementing it in their own internships and coming back and sharing their success with you has been really incredible. And and to see people have the same passion for the field is something that gives me a lot of encouragement and it sort of refreshes me because in the field sometimes you can get bogged down with the stressors and you know you can go through sort of negative little lulls and people can be really stressed out and that can sort of affect your view of the field and then being in this program again and seeing you know fresh students about to go out into the field and their passion and their enthusiasm it's like a little recharge just re refreshes you in it allows you to go back out there again. It's, it's huge. Um, it is, when you're working with the people in this field that you will be working with, they have trauma. They have um, sort of a delicate mental health situation. And being sort of a good listener or a good talker isn't sufficient to hold the, the nature of their challenges and really work with them properly in a way that they deserve. So yes, it's important that um, they feel my warmth. It's important that they feel I'm listening to them when I'm in the field, but my training and my academic history within the Child and Youth Work program allows me to then take that information that I'm listening to and hold it and create treatment plans that are worthy of their 
their challenges of the trust they've placed in me. So when they're telling me about their diagnoses, I understand what that means. I understand the challenges that they face. I understand some of their limitations. And I understand um, what it means for them in their daily life. When I decide um, a treatment philosophy to work within, to work with these clients, it's not just, oh, you know, it seems like a good day outside, so we'll go outside and play. It's evidence-based. It has a basis behind it. When I talk with families about um, their relationships with their children, I'm doing it within an attachment-based theory, an attachment-based practice. And while it may seem like I'm just telling a parent or asking them to try out a way of hugging their child or, um, you know, let's make sure that a, a, a visit with your child has a snack or a lunch and then a supervised or a structured play and an unstructured play. That may seem like it's just, oh, this is what you do in a visit, but it's not. It has a reasoning behind it. It has, you know, attachment theory in terms of providing nurturance and sustenance with a snack. It has um, understanding of how to help a child feel structured in terms of the structured play and gain that trust and security from their parents. So it, things that may seem sort of just like off the cuff or offhand actually have a lot of research and that allows the shifts to happen with families. Thank you. Fabulous. My name is David Gauz. That's D-A-V-I-D. Last name is G-A-H-S. And the agency? I work for an agency called Peel Children's Center, which is in Mississauga, Ontario. Well, my role at Peel Children's Center is on the community crisis response.